we'll go ahead and get uh, started. Um, so this talk's called Dynamically Sassy Generating Dynamic CSS and Rails. And it's a uh, talk goes over a few different things. Obviously, we're going to talk about how do we generate dynamic CSS and Rails. And this is just this isn't just your basic, I'm going to have a SAS style sheet, and it's going to render out just some basic CSS for me. Because what we really want to accomplish is a way to take user input uh, in production and generate dynamic CSS from that user input. Like an HTTP request comes in with some parameter and we can generate CSS from that. So this talk is going to walk through some of the challenges to accomplish that as well as highlight how this was actually used. This was something that I investigated and helped implement at the beginning of the year for my company's product called Simply Built. So to start off, my name is Jeremy Fairbank. I'm a web developer, uh, mainly do a lot of front-end work, um, but I've also done a lot of back-end as well since we're talking about Rails and SaaS here. Um, on GitHub, I'm Jay Fairbank. On Twitter, I'll pop a polio, and I blog at blog.jeremyfairbank.com. I work for a company called Push. We're a design and development agency. Um, and we're all remote, which is pretty awesome. So I get to work from home. Um, and we do a lot of mainly front end stuff as far as our client work. Uh, a lot of Backbone and Angular and now a lot of React. Um, in addition to being an agency, we have our own product. I just mentioned it. It's called Simply Built. It's a website builder uh, along with website hosting and domain management all rolled into one, so it's really perfect for small to medium businesses or even for personal use. I use it for my own personal website. And I bring up Simply Built because we're going to talk a little bit about it. So it's a website builder. It has some sort of interface for the user to drag and drop blocks of content into their website. And they can fill it in with whatever copy, pictures, whatever they like. And then, obviously, they want to style it with colors and selecting one of our themes. So to be able to accomplish those type of goals from our perspective, we need SAS style sheets because we can capitalize on the modularity and the reusability in SAS to share a lot of styles amongst different style sheets for different themes and for colors. So one of the things we wanted to add was this feature called custom color palettes. So at the time, a user would select a theme for their site, and then we would provide them with some just default color palettes that they could use. So they select a color palette, and that gives them certain colors that they can pick and choose for, say, the background and uh, link and button colors. But we wanted to allow them to somehow customize what colors they get, but we didn't want to make it too overwhelming. Sometimes with color wheels and things like that, you give the user too much to work with, it can become overwhelming, and then it just becomes an underused feature. So we found that a nice middle ground would be let them select some sort of seed color. And then we take that seed color and we generate custom palettes for them based on certain color algorithms. And so that's what we wanted to implement. Now, this talk's going to focus mainly on the sort of the operations side of that, how do you make this work? We're not going to really focus on the algorithms or the color generation. So the challenge is, like I mentioned, is we need to generate some sort of style sheet based on the user's input. At the same time, we want to avoid any duplication. We already have style sheets that work with these uh, default palettes, and that's all static, but we'd like to capitalize on what we've already done in those style sheets for these dynamic ones. And then another thing, as we work through this, since we're going to be generating this CSS in production, so we're going to find this can definitely affect performance. And that's for the entire web server, possibly. So high-level overview of what we're trying to accomplish here. Client's going to generate some HTTP request for a style sheet. Gets passed over to our Rails server. It's going to generate the CSS with the custom palettes and then send it back to the user. So our roadmap for looking into this exploring is, first off, you know, why SAS? Uh, what benefits does it have? Why do, we, why do we use it for Simply Build? And I'm sure most of you use SAS already, and you have perfect reasons why you do. Um, we also, if we're going to get this user input, we need some sort of interoperability between SAS and between Ruby. Or there's really no way to get some of that information into some static style sheet, right? 
So we'll look at the SAS engine class and how we can use that to render these style sheets for us. And then we'll also see, like I mentioned, how this can end up affecting web server performance. And we'll look at ways that we can try to alleviate the performance issues we run into, such as caching and background processing, and then even just simply refactoring. So first off, why SAS? I've mentioned it's modular, so you can have many separate style, style sheets. You can devote a style sheet to a certain widget or feature, and then you know you can import these different style sheets to compose them together to make your final style sheet. So it, it's great for separating out the different concerns of your UI. Same way that helps you reinforce dry principles, so you can utilize modularity and other features to create very dry SAS. Um, and then SAS it's, has its own little scripting language in it, so it offers loops and functions as well as data structures like lists and maps. So definitely want to try to use those in some form or fashion to be able to generate uh, these style sheets. So here's an example of some of those features I've talked about. So in this instance we have a very simple way we could use some static palettes and display that or create a style sheet, a static style sheet. So first off, our palettes variable, that's a list. We put it inside parentheses. Inside each of these, we have maps, which are like hashes and Ruby or dictionaries and Python. Um, and it's basically like a list, but you have keys, string keys. In this case, we have BG and text. So we're saying here's the background color and here's the text color. And so we have three of these. So we have a list of three items. And then we can loop over these. So in SAS, your loops, four loops, they usually index with one instead of zero in SAS. And it's an inclusive range, so we say for i from one through three, and that's gonna help us loop through each of these palettes. So we loop each over each palette, and then we can grab whatever palette we're at with an int function, and we can also use a map get function to pull that particular uh, background color or text color from the palette. So see, SAS can be pretty powerful, and it's actually kind of like a functional language in some respects. And then once we want to compile this, you see it can generate out this, say, a theme file with different palettes. So if you had some uh, functionality to change what class is used on the body, then that would end up affecting what styles or colors get used in the actual UI. But this is pretty... Um, coupled right now. It's not really reusable. What if I mentioned we want different themes and eventually we want to be able to do this in a dynamic fashion. So how can we make this reusable? Well, one approach we can take is something like this. So now I have, say, two theme style sheets. And all they define right now are just a palettes list. In each one, they have different colors. And then they're going to import this UI partial. And so we've now separated out what the colors actually are with the logic of actually using those colors. And so SAS has some interesting scoping rules you'll notice. So I can define variables in one file, import another file, and that file that I import can reference whatever variables I've defined in the file that included or imported it. And so we could capitalize on this then to be able to reuse that logic of looping over and generating these palette class names we loop over that based on what palettes variable is available globally. And you could accomplish something similar maybe with a parametric mix-in, but I kind of like this approach. But we're still dealing with static data, even now that we're reusing this in a, um, these default themes. So we still want somehow to do this dynamically. So really I'm wanting something like this function, get dynamic palettes and it's going to set it to that palettes variable, and then I import the UI, and now I'm doing this dynamically. So this starts to get into the, the SAS Ruby interoperability I mentioned. So if you've ever done anything, like if you've built a gem for Ruby with native C, or if you've worked with any other language that implements a different language, if you want to create a function for it, you would normally, you would do it in your source language. So Ruby is the source language, and then you work with types and things that exist in the target language, which would be SAS. And we'll, we'll dive into more what I mean by that. So when you want to add these functions, 
to your SAS, you're going to first reference this module, SAS script functions. And this is something SAS has internally in uh, their code base. So any method you add to this module will become a function in your SAS style sheets. In this case, here's the get dynamic palettes function. In this case, too, since we're Ruby, we can't use dashes, so we use underscores, but we can reference it with, with the dashes in uh, SAS. So inside of it, what we're doing is we're going to generate uh, three items in a palettes array, and then we're going to return that as a list. But notice these SAS script values, and that alludes to what I mentioned to you earlier. Since we're targeting SAS, we need to use types that exist in SAS. So even though this is a Ruby method, we can't return Ruby types. We need to return SAS types. So all of these are available in this very long namespacing SAS script value. So our palettes array, it's going to have the three maps. So we create the three maps. And then it has some string keys to, in this case, we're just going to use random hexadecimal colors. And then eventually that palettes is going to get wrapped in this list, because we need a list, not an array. And then on the bottom, we just have the helper method for creating these random hexadecimal colors. But even though we still need to somehow get user input, so that's one way to get dynamic, but how are we going to get information from the user down to the style sheet? So I need some sort of get dynamic palettes from user magically. So here's how we're going to try to use user input. So remember normally, assets like style sheets, they're static. You pre-compile them for production, and then you'll probably serve them with a CDN or some separate file server. Um, so we can't really do anything dynamically with those. So we're going to have to manually render this from a Rails controller. And that's how we'll utilize the SAS engine class that I mentioned earlier. So our controller might look something like this. It's called a palettes controller. And in this case, the style is going to be so simple, two lines were just created as a string constant called template. And it's going to call a get custom palettes function. So that's SAS. So remember, we're going to have to implement get custom palettes as a method on that functions module, like earlier. So our action for custom palettes, that's what the user is going to end up hitting um, with a HTTP request. And notice now we're going to reference this SAS engine class. And we're going to instantiate it, pass in the template string and some options. And this is what we're going to use to render out our CSS. And this is what you know, the asset pipeline would be doing normally with your static style sheets and pre-compiling them for production. So the first couple options, they're pretty basic. I'm just saying I'm using the SCS, SCSS syntax with my style sheets. And style expand, it just says, I want you to render out like what you typically would write CSS as, just so it's a little more readable in this instance. In production, you'd probably want to minify it. Load paths. This is one of the really important options. So normally, you know, in, uh, in your Rails applications where you have your style sheets, they can reference each other through the imports pretty easily on their own. And that's because of something like this load path has already been set up for you. So we're going to have to set it up ourselves. And it's like in other languages, when you require or import a module, it needs to resolve the name of that module somehow. And so it'll use load paths. In this case, we'll just tell it it's in the app asset style sheets. And then finally, this is the really critical option we need. And this is how we're actually going to get data from the user into the style sheet, this custom option. So whatever, all these options, in fact, they will become available inside your SAS functions, but we're going to pass in custom data via the custom option. So we're just passing in a hash with a color key, and it's grabbing the custom color parameter that the user would supply. So now we'll return back to the functions module. And we've added the get custom palettes method now, and it's going to utilize that data we just passed in. And so we see here we grab off the options, which that's available inside these functions. We go to custom, and then we go to color, and that gives us that color. Now, we would make sure in this instance that the user has to supply a hexadecimal string. And that way, we can use this helper class method on the SAS script value color class called from hex. And that will easily convert it to the color type, because we'll remember, we need SAS types in these functions. Excuse me. So 
Again, we're going to generate this palette of three colors. And in this case, we'll just do something a little different for this particular example. We will lighten the color and darken it for generating the background color and the text color, respectively. And we'll, for each palette, we'll up the factor. So the first one's will lighten and darken by 10%, and the next one 20 and the third one by 30%. And then finally, we return the value list. And to show you a demo of that, and how pretty simple it is to get, uh, get this set up, I have this. So, quite blown up. So I'm going to go to the network tab here, and I'm going to basically type in a custom color, let it generate it for me, and show you that it's actually returning CSS back, and that's driving how the UI changes. And I'll say red, and see I get back this CSS. There's the request I made, custom CSS, and in this instance I just use a color parameter, but I set to red, and I did cheat a little because I used a named color. I have a gem that converts that automatically to a hexadecimal color for me, but I could pass in this hexadecimal as well for red. So I click on that, bring this over, and see it's generating this CSS I set up. So it's generated from a loop, bodied up palette one, palette two, palette three, and then I could do a different color. I could do like a blue. And see the values have changed. So this is pretty easy way to get up and running didn't take a lot to get this to work. So we can already start generating dyna dynamic CSS uh, from user input. So returning back, now that I had that working and I was ready to apply that to Simply Built, generate a quest, pass it up to the server, it's rendered, and then it takes a while to get back to the user. So something's wrong here. That was not very quick, and that could create issues. And in fact, I was dealing with around two second response times, and that's not really good for web server performance. That's, not only does that affect the user waiting on it, but it's gonna end up possibly affecting other people using the site for things not even related to this. So we gotta do something about this response time. And what's, the problem is a SaaS is kind of slow, it renders pretty slow, especially when you start dealing with a lot of complex SAS rules. And so what we had was this compounding effect of we have data structure access, like the lists and the maps. We're using Compass, which helps us with some helper mix-ins and functions for prefixing and whatnot. We have pretty complex CSS rules, because um, as we slowly add new features here and there, you know how CSS can sometimes build up and sometimes you need to go back and refactor it. Um, you already saw we do loops. And so imagine all this complexity already and then you're looping over that three times, four times, however many times, it just keeps adding to the render time. And we have a lot of file dependencies, so everything is modular, we're importing a lot of stuff. It's possible we're re-importing things, which actually, does not help performance because SAS does not cache that information, so it really re-imports stuff and recompiles it. So just to show you then why this is important and how this could affect even other users, I want to give you this scenario. So we're using Puma. It's a multi-threaded web server for Rails, um, and we have it on Heroku, and that might fork a couple processes of Puma so you at least have some concurrency with separate processes. So up top I have, say, two processes, two rail servers running on Puma. They have a couple threads inside each of them for doing the actual work. And so a client sends up a request for one of these style sheets. A thread from one process comes down, it gets scheduled on a, on a CPU core, and it starts rendering out this slowly, render, slowly rendered SAS. Okay, another one comes in. Well, the other processor, it picks it up, a thread gets scheduled, and it's rendering out some other uh, style sheet. But then what happens if some other user just wants to visit the home page? Well, they're actually not going to get served yet because we're dealing with MRI Ruby here and we're dealing with Puma. We don't get true concurrency with our threads. So this is going to create an issue because this SAS render time, that's CPU bound. We can't just you know throw that off to IO. Uh, it's not IO, so you can't really throw it off to the... Uh, 
kind of hide the latency. So we're affecting other users that need to visit our site because they're waiting on these other threads to finish up rendering the SAS. So we need to find ways to improve the performance, any way to alleviate this issue. And we can start to identify some of the problems. Well, first off, we'll notice we are unnecessarily re-rendering style sheets. So if something comes in for this particular color, steel blue, we render out the style sheet. Later on, another request comes in, well, we re-render it again. And even a third request could come in and we, again, re-render this. Our style sheets that back this, the UI, they're not changing frequently enough to justify re-rendering this all the time. So this would be a good candidate for looking at caching. And the question is, why do we re-render this for a certain color? If we know it's going to be the same, no matter which user is requesting it, we might as well cache it. So the general idea is the first time a user requests it, we render it, because they're unfortunately the unlucky one that has to wait. But once it's rendered, we can cache that. And then any future requests will be served from the cache. And so this is perfect for colors that might end up being pretty popular picks, like typical red or blue or whatnot. And for using this, we're utilizing memcache, and there's also the dolly gem, which allows you to hook into memcache from Ruby. And in fact, this is built into Rails now, so we can utilize Rails abstractions for this. So to utilize this in Rails, we'll have the cache store option, which you set in your production environment configuration file. And we'll set equal to the memcache store symbol, and we'll pass in some constants which define our server URL and as well as options for the cache store. Um, and then to use it, you'll utilize the Rails cache object. It has a write method for writing values to the cache and then a fetch method for retrieving those values from the cache. There's also a second option with the, the fetch method where you can pass in a block. And what that block does basically is if you have a cache miss when you try to retrieve the value from the cache, it'll invoke the block to create the value that needs to be inserted into the cache. So that would be our style sheet, for example. So what this kind of looks like then if we're utilizing caches. So a request comes in, first we check the cache. It's not in there, we have a miss, so we have to go out and we have to render it. But then we can write that back to the cache. And so future requests, when they check the cache, we'll have a hit and then we can retrieve it from there and return that value and not have to worry about re-rendering all this. And this will drastically improve performance. In fact, it took it from that two seconds to now when you're pulling it from the cache, only around 100 to 200 milliseconds for these subsequent, subsequent requests. But now, how do we deal with the initial render? Is there anything we can do about that specifically to help just improve the performance overall of our server? Because if we happen to have multiple users all request a new color at the same time, we're still blocking threads and we're not allowing other requests to come through. So this is where we'd want to look at maybe doing something asynchronous. So take the work of rendering off to some background process that could be more specialized to that and not going to necessarily cause other requests to block. And for this we're utilizing Sidekick, which is a single threaded uh, background worker. It has a queue and you add options for different jobs to run. So the picture of what this kind of looks like, the client generates the request again, it comes over to the server, but then the actual work of rendering gets pushed off to this worker process. And that worker is going to be responsible for actually rendering it out. The server then is going to immediately reply back to the client with some key string. And this will be the key that the client will need to reference in the cache. So the basic idea is, here's your key, I'll let you know when this is actually ready and available in the cache and you can make a subsequent request for the CSS. So eventually the worker generates a CSS, we were maybe displaying some loading screen for the client, the worker is going to write that to the cache and then like I mentioned somehow notify the client either via web sockets or the client could be polling to find out when it's ready. Then the client once it knows it's ready it's going to make a new request passing in that key that goes to the cache, the server can look it up, retrieve it, and send it back to the client. So to do this in Ruby, you would set up a, in this instance, we'll call it a SAS custom palettes worker. And you include the sidekick worker module. And what that does is it allows you to add this perform method. 
and that perform method is going to actually do the work. And so it's going to call this SAS custom palettes class, and that's going to be a class I'll show you in the next slide, but it basically is, we're just going to use that as an abstraction to wrap over the SAS engine rendering. So it takes a color option, when we instantiate it, and then we call its render method. So SAS custom palettes now. This is what wraps over that SAS engine rendering I showed you earlier. <clears throat> So first off, it takes in the color, and we'll set that as an instance variable. It also set a key instance variable, and it's going to use some way of knowing how to generate a cache key. It's going to have this render async method, and this is what the controller is going to end up calling. So when the controller fields the request from the user, instead of calling the normal SAS engine render method, which will cause it to block and take up CPU time, it will call this render async. So what it's going to basically do is it's going to quickly check, is this in the cache? If it's not, then I'm going to schedule my worker with the perform in async color. And that was misspelled. But that's going to basically end up calling that perform method I showed you earlier. So it's kind of like this cyclic um, dependency where SAS custom palettes will call the worker. Eventually, the worker will call SAS custom palettes again to render it. And then finally, return the key back to the controller so it can return it to the client. And then finally, here's the render method, and that's what gets called by the worker. So he's going to instantiate the SAS custom palettes, call the render method, and it's going to generate the CSS, and then it's going to write that to the cache. So even though this is going to help improve performance overall on the web server, we need to kind of look at this from the bigger picture. You know, what are the downsides to this? Well, it definitely increased code complexity. Even the, the picture I showed you, it, we the interactions increased a lot. Um, we'd have to possibly introduce the polling client or introduce WebSocket code. We have to have ways to deal with what if when these jobs in the background jobs fail and how do we retry that? Doing exception handling with async stuff is a lot harder. <clears throat> what happens if there's not a worker ready yet? So we may be potentially waiting for a free worker to become available to even do this rendering job. So we may introduce more latency to the client. There also might be increased network traffic because we have the WebSocket code or the polling code. And of course, we still, the initial request, there's going to be some latency for that client. So really, is there anything we can do for that particular first request? Can we do better than background processing? And in fact, yes, just with refactoring, surprisingly. <clears throat> so. Really, it comes down to simplifying. So in this case, our SAS has gotten really complex. You know, we're kind of in that startup mode, so we're constantly adding on more features and more things to our CSS and maybe not looking at a high level <coughs> ways to refactor it or make it simpler and faster. So just keeping your CSS rules simple. And kind of going with that, if you use SAS, you know you can nest rules to uh, define your parent-child relationships. And maybe going with something like BEM for defining your CSS classes could help. Because you still, even though you want to try something like BEM, you want to still utilize some of the features that are in SAS, like modules, importing partials, um, and mix-ins and functions. Also limit looping where you can if possible, because that could add more to the complexity of the render. <clears throat> I mentioned earlier redundant imports. So, Normally, in a language like Ruby, if you import or require a file, uh, it might run the code once, and then you have some cached object representation of that. So if you require it in a different file, you're going to get that cached information that's already in memory. Well, with SAS, when I import something in one file, if I import it in another file that may be down in um, sort of a nested imported hierarchy, it's not going to remember this was already imported once, and so it's going to have to recompile all that SAS again. So identifying any place where you're importing the same thing more than once can help out a lot. Also removing compass, it's definitely very beneficial, lots of helpful mix-ins and functions, but nowadays if you're only targeting modern browsers, then you probably don't need the prefixes anymore, and even if you do, there's certain tools that allow you to automatically prefix your CSS, and then you don't have to worry about using things like Compass. And if there are certain mix-ins or functions you really need or want, then you could handwrite those yourselves. And all this to remove the overhead of importing all the Compass stuff in your rendering. <clears throat>
And then finally, an another option is you could actually move to libsass. And this is SAS that's implemented in C. And then you can still target it from Ruby with the SAS C Ruby gem. And that could potentially help out a lot with performance as well. So doing this with Simply Built and refactoring it and getting rid of all that background processing, we found that you know response time went four, became four times faster. And we're looking at just around 500 milliseconds. And looking at the trade-off between that render time versus all the complexity that came with the background processing, this seemed more favorable and the latency wasn't too bad from a user standpoint. And then we still have the cached response time of 150 to 200 milliseconds. So this is a big win. So what are the takeaways uh, from all this then? So we talked about generating dynamic CSS, how to accomplish that. And so it depends a lot on the SAS and Ruby interoperability by adding methods to the SAS script functions module and then injecting stuff through the options in the SAS engine, such as a custom color. Um, we found that even something like SAS, which could seem pretty benign just rendering out CSS, that can end up affecting server performance. So it's really I, what I like to stress in this talk is like performance is really important even for something as simple as this. And so we have to make sure we look at good practices for alleviating that. We looked at caching, which I always recommend caching. And we definitely still use caching for this in Simply Built. And then potentially looking at things like asynchronous processing. Fortunately, we were able to remove that complexity. But in other instances, even if you're not rendering SAS, it's a good option to look at if you have some highly CPU bound tasks for your uh, web application. And then pretty simply, clean, simple SAS can render pretty quickly. And so it's important to always take a look at your CSS, make sure it's not getting out of control with looping and nested rules um, and lots of file imports. So keeping it clean, keeping it simple can benefit you a lot. And that's it. Kind of a short talk, but thank you all so much. There's URLs for slides and the demo and code samples if you're interested in looking to this more. So thank you. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Yeah. At the time, no. And I think it's because I wasn't as well known at the time. Because this was beginning of this year is when I, I had done some research back in December and then started implementing this in January. So I didn't wasn't aware of post CSS at the time. Now, I'm on a separate project now. So it may be something that the team that works on Simply Built could look into in the future. Yeah. No, I haven't. I would, because I haven't looked a lot in the LibSAS, but there are a lot of different bindings, like Node, if you wanted to go with Node, for example, there's uh, bindings to it. So there's ways to still get um, sort of custom functions inside that. So I'll say I don't know, but I'm going to at least uh, dare to assume that there are ways to still inject custom options, like I showed you with the SAS engine. Uh, no matter what route you take. So I, I see this as still being feasible in other stacks. All right. Thank you all.